Support for this show comes from Lead Quizzes. Lead Quizzes helps you easily set up high converting quizzes to capture and qualify leads for your business. Visit leadquizzes.com slash podcast to get a 14-day free trial today. The biggest challenge I see today, especially with young entrepreneurs in their 20s, is they really don't have the attention span to go deep enough into a subject matter to master it and get really good at it, which is what is required to achieve success in anything. Yeah. You know, it's like, well, I watch this hour long blog or webinar training session on Facebook advertising or building an Instagram channel. And now I'm supposed to be able to do it right. And like, no. From Lead Quizzes, it's Journey to Seven Figures, a show about entrepreneurs and the stories behind how they grew their business to seven figures and beyond. We cover the good, the bad, and the ugly, and the lessons they learned along the way. I'm Jeremy Ellens, and this is episode number one. On today's show, I interview Mike Dillard. Mike built his first million dollar business by the age of 27, teaching small business owners how to effectively market their products and services online using attraction marketing strategies. In 2010, he founded a financial education company in order to teach others how to achieve financial freedom through investment strategies commonly reserved for the wealthy. Mike's most recent business generated $5.5 million of revenue last year while running on autopilot. Combined, his businesses have produced more than $50 million in revenue without outside funding. If you're interested in learning how he did it, you'll love this episode. So without further ado, let's jump in. All right, welcome, Journey to Seven Figures. I'm really excited to introduce you guys to an amazing guest today, Mike Dillard. He's been a friend of mine for years. I've always looked up to him. He's a great guy. I'm very excited to have you here today, Mike. Yeah, glad to be here, Jeremy. This is going to be fun. Awesome. Cool. So we're going to be talking about your journey to seven figures with your current company first. So can you give us a quick like one to two sentence around what you do as Self-Made Man and the associated products you have with that company? Yeah. You know, Self-Made Man is actually a pet project right now that's not going to launch until February. But Mike Dillard Mentoring, if you will, has been around for about two years now and really just produced a couple of marquee courses, if you will, after being an entrepreneur online for the last 10 years with some of the most important skill sets or lessons that I'd acquired during that time. And one of them is on building an email list. Another one is is really kind of on general mentorship, leadership, and lessons learned when it comes to investing your money, protecting your assets, building a brand over the long term and things like that. But, you know, I started that about two years ago and it was really designed to do two things. One was to fund two additional endeavors I was undertaking, one in the hydroponic food industry, Evergrow, and the other is with the evolution of self-made man that we've been working on for the last year. And the other thing that it needed to do besides produce revenue was to do it in a way that was completely automated and that didn't take my time. So in a very strategic way, when I mapped this out, I really built the business around a model that would support both of those agendas and those goals. And it has. So you know, List Grow is our list building course. We've been marketing and promoting that for about two years now. And then we have Mike Dillard Mentoring, which is basically a monthly subscription course that runs on autopilot. And so does the list building course. And I really haven't had to touch those in two years. This year, the sale of those two programs produced about five and a half million dollars in revenue, which has funded the development of everything else we've been working on. Awesome. So five and a half million dollars in 2017. You're helping people with like mentoring them on whether it's finances or I know you go into like relationships as well as like business. So you help them with a lot of different stuff. But prior to starting this business, so Mike, you've generated over $50 million in your businesses. What experiences in your past do you think helped give you the confidence or even the capabilities to be like successful in this latest endeavor of yours? Well, my first six years attempting to build a business way back in my late teens, early 20s, essentially my college years were a complete failure for a good five, six years. I didn't make a dime. So it definitely wasn't easy. It wasn't fast. Around year five, I started to realize, okay, whatever I'm doing is not working. I've tried this with 10 different businesses or whatever it may be for five years. I'm still not making money. What's going on? And I had a really big epiphany at that point, which was the fact that it's not going to be a product or an opportunity or a marketing funnel or anything else that's going to make you wealthy or successful or generate a specific result that you're looking for. It really comes down to you acquiring a new set of skills that will allow you to execute on your ideas and to build something. 
So for the first five or six years, I chased after things that I thought would do the work for me. From that moment on, I was like, okay, I'm going to focus on increasing my value to other people, acquiring new skill sets. And I dove into the topic of copywriting specifically because I needed to learn how to sell. Let's back up for a second. So before that, over this five to six year period where you're kind of struggling, like what kind of businesses were those that you were like involved with? Gosh, that was back in the late 90s. So that was primarily network marketing stuff. This is web 1.0. This is before video, before social media, before capture pages, like before all of this stuff. So for a broke college student, network marketing was really, you know, the best option at that time to try and build something. So that's where I got my start. Yeah. And so what was that like? Like how... I guess, how much success did you have in network marketing? And like, what do you feel like the roadblocks were of like why you weren't able to break through and you know, why you decided to start studying copywriting? Right. So for the first five years, again, didn't make a dime, hated every single minute of it, but I wanted to make money and I wanted to be an entrepreneur more than I wanted to have a job. So I just kept at it. Mm -hmm. Uh, You know, I'd buy all of the training programs, go out to the local events and do everything. And what I finally realized was that even if I figured this out and made it work, which I eventually did, I absolutely hate what I'm doing. Mm-hmm. And the fact that I'm very, very introverted, I prefer to sit at home by myself all day and read or write. And I was at that point in an industry designed for extroverted people. It's network marketing, it's networking, it's about people and building relationships and holding events and all of that stuff just was torture. But I eventually figured it out. I eventually started to make it work. I built an initial team of two or 300 people at one point. And I was like, this sucks. I absolutely hate this. I don't care how much money I'm making. How did you build a team of two to 300 people? Was it just surely just hustle and grind and just keeping after it? Yeah, it was a cold calling lead list that I was buying and buying leads. And that was after acquiring those skill sets over the courses of years, I finally figured out how to talk to somebody on the phone. And so I was like, okay, I know how to do this now. I'm getting results and I don't want to do it anymore. This is miserable. Okay. Let's talk about that real quick because like talking with people on the phone, that's, you probably had some type of sales script, whether you followed one or not, which probably led to some of your copywriting skills or like interest in that. No, no, not at all. Actually. No. What changed and what I learned on the phone was how to have posture and confidence. Okay. When you're a broke college student, it's very difficult to talk to an adult and pitch them on a business opportunity. What effing credibility do I have? Yep. Again, I was very shy. I've never sold anything in my life before. So what do you do? You're typically very nice and you try not to challenge challenge people or, you know, whatever it may be. And that industry is about leadership. It's about building a team and leading a team and teaching and training those people to do the same. And essentially, if you're going to come into the sales process or the recruiting process with this beta, meek beta mindset and energy, you're going to fail, which is what I did for many years. And then I finally figured that out with the help of a few mentors. I finally figured out how to have a freaking spine and to hold up standards for who I was willing to look for. And that was the huge epiphany, which was ultimately, it's much better if you present yourself and whatever it is you're selling in a way that inspires people to pursue you rather than for you to chase after them. And the more you chase after people, the more they tend to want to run away. So that was a really big epiphany. And the next part of the equation was, well, okay, I'm making 50, 60, 70 cold calls a day and I'm talking to leads and it's very repetitive and I don't know who these people are. And it's just like going through the same routine a dozen times like this sucks. And there's no leverage to it. All I can do is get better at closing and converting people, but I can't call more people in a day. Mm -hmm. So that was another problem that really inspired me to say, okay, well, how do I solve all of these problems? How do I solve the problem of me not wanting to talk to people on the phone anymore? And how do I solve this leverage or lack of leverage issue? Mm -hmm. And so that's really where I was like, I have to get online. I have to start advertising online, generating my own leads online and creating essentially sales pieces online, whether it's, you know, at that time, it was just a one page sales letter that would do all of the selling and telling for me. And well, now I can present it to a thousand people a day or 3000 people a day instead of 50, 60, 70. And I don't have to do any of the work. The tools do the work. The marketing does the work. So I was like, that's what I need to do if I'm going to stay in this world and figure it out. And so that's when I discovered direct response marketing, guys like Dan Kennedy and really learned how to write copy. And so how do you essentially write a sales presentation, a one page website that will take someone on an emotional and intellectual journey 
from the beginning to the end to where you're introducing yourself 20, maybe 30 pages later, they're pulling out their credit card and they're joining your team all without sure. your participation, right? So that's obviously a skill set, but it's the most arguably valuable skill set in the world. And I just dove into that topic for 12 to 18 months about every book and course I could find on copywriting and eventually figured that out. And I started recording audio scripts and writing letters that would then sell the opportunity for me putting together the first kind of capture page and advertising on Google AdWords for the very first time, which was very new back then. And I started targeting a very specific group of people that I was going after, which was other leaders, other people who didn't need me to babysit them or train them. And so I ended up over the next 90 days recruiting 15 people that were very, very specific as far as what their problem was and what their degree of previous success was. And out of those 15, I believe seven or eight became the top 10 distributors in our company, which made me the number one distributor in the company. And, and these were people through AdWords that you were recruiting? Other leaders in other companies who weren't satisfied with what they were getting paid, essentially. Mm -hmm. And I thought Opportunity at that time had a really superior comp plan. And they were right. And they showed up and started making 10x more money and started building their own teams. And it was the easiest thing I'd ever done, but it took me six, seven years to figure out how to do that. Okay. Um, so that was the, yeah, that was the beginning of my entrepreneurial career. Gosh, 15 years ago now. Yeah. So if anyone follows Mike, you talk a lot about this, like acquiring a skill and being able to give value to people, which is going to allow you to earn more. And you continually say like copywriting is your thing. So you said you bought every book, every course on copywriting. If you had to go like start over and like learn copywriting again, like what's like a simple like roadmap of how you do that? That's it. Well, there's two things. There's buying the books and the courses so that you really understand the fundamentals around the psychology. You know, that's piece number one. One of the premier books is Influenced by Robert Cialdini, right? Yep. Anything that Dan Kennedy ever wrote. And what that's going to do is it's going to give you the psychology and the framework and the understanding of how sales and attraction work. But after that, you need to master the art of communicating persuasively and clearly in a written format. And the best way that I've ever found to acquire that is to simply go back and write out proven sales letters by hand. So I did that every day for months. I went out and found the most successful letters I could find. And I would write out five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten 10 pages a day over the course of an hour or two and would do that every single night before calling it quits. And what that does is it allows you to internalize more of that psychological framework, but also the language patterns of the types of words to use and not words, what a clear sales presentation sounds like and feels like. And it's just like walking or, you know, visiting a foreign country within a day or two, you're going to start picking up the little accent, you know, accents that they have, and you're going to start using them without even consciously mm -hmm. thinking about it. And that's what essentially what you're doing here by writing out these letters is you're picking up these little nuanced pieces of the art, if you will, instead of the science of copywriting. And that's what I did for about a year. Awesome. What would you say? Like, I, I know a lot of people when they start doing that, whether it's like Gary Halbert letters or like starting to write those out, you know, those are pretty old letters. And so a lot of people that are brand new, they'll say, well, these are outdated. Like the language is very old. How did that impact like you learning copywriting and making it something that still applies today? You don't have to use the old letters. You can use new letters. All, all I want to see is you using something that's actively converted and made a crap ton of sales. That's what you're looking for. You just don't want to copy stuff that obviously didn't convert. So you just have to be very specific. You know, the highest paid copywriters in the world these days work for Stansbury Research and Agora. And so if you want to start at the best, go to their websites and, and start reading and rewriting their sales scripts and their video transcripts. Perfect. Yeah. Okay. Awesome. So you went from like being in the network space, I believe the next space was finance. Was that right? Elevation group? Yeah. So we ended up, you know, writing books on what we're doing in the network marketing industry. Magnetic sponsoring was the really big one that put me mm -hmm. on the map. And we started writing courses on Google AdWords and essentially what we were doing for lead gen. So that did about 25 million in revenue through that company. And we did that for four or five years. And then around 2010, I was turning 30. And I realized that I had no idea what to do with the money that I was making mm -hmm. other than spend it. <laughs> and so turning 30 and essentially having made millions of dollars at this point and having nothing to show from it from a savings or an investment perspective, I was like, okay, I need to figure this out. So we started a second, essentially little tiny business. I was having a child at the time. So I wanted this to work from home. I wanted my work level to be 
as little as possible. And I essentially wanted to run the business myself with the help of a customer or service agent or two. So my biggest problem in life at the time was I have no idea how to invest. And I was like, I think other people have this issue as well. We just came out of the crash of 2008, 2009. Nobody knows what the hell to do anymore with their money. Mm -hmm. And so it was like, let's figure this out. I'm obviously not an expert in, in this world, so I can't teach anything. I can't go out and write a book or a course on it. So my only real option was to interview the people who were the experts. So that was it. We were going to do a private membership site, and I was going to do an interview a month in person with the people that I was either investing with or learning from and looked up to, you know, Robert Kiyosaki and Ken McElroy and, and, and Tom Wheelwright and guys like these. And that's it. And we would charge $97 a month to get access to the info. and it was 97 a month or 597 a year. I wrote a 90 minute webinar script to sell it. I'd never really done a webinar script before. And we started promoting it to my existing audience. I believe it was November, December of 2011 or 10. Mm-hmm. And we did 3.2 million in sales in our first seven days. We acquired 8,600 customers in our first week. And this was from like the existing Magnetic email list you had built? Yeah. yeah. Yeah, I don't remember how big it was at the time. Probably about 100,000, 150,000 people. Okay. But that was a new record by far, you know, $3 million in a week. So the key is there, I think, Mike, is like you already had been building a list. You learned how to drive predictable leads through paid traffic, AdWords, and then you learn how to capture them and convert them. So you were learning how to do that. And then I think one other thing that you do really well, Mike, is you build like a really good audience where they're like, they're attached to you. They really care about you. And you... You've always done a great job of saying like, this is my mission. This is what I'm trying to do. Do you want to explain any of that? Like how you think like you went from, you had this amazing webinar script that converted, but there's obviously some other things that led up to that success. Yeah. I mean, just being honest and authentic. That's rule number one here. That's the foundation to all of this. And if I hadn't been that way in Magnetic, I wouldn't have had an audience to launch, you know, EVG to, right? So, Mm -hmm. and with the financial webinar, I didn't get on there and say, hey, I'm going to teach you how to become rich. I said, I have no effing idea what I'm doing. And if you feel the same way and you want to figure this out, let's go do it together, right? So it's, again, being completely transparent and honest. I'm not trying to be somebody that I'm not here. And so if you'll always follow those principles, people will will follow you forever because they feel like they can trust you. If you make a mistake, just admit it, right? So that's kind of been the core philosophy on how I've treated my audience. And because that's how I would want to be treated. And it's worked out really, really, really well. Uh, Yeah. And that's, and that's something transparent. Like if any of you guys follow Mike or you get targeted by some of his Facebook ads, you'll see in the comments that there's people that have been following Mike for years and they'll like, they'll back him up when any, anybody says like, Oh, I don't believe in like this kind of thing. I can't learn how to like, you know, do marketing online from someone that's running ads. There's always people that are backing you up and you always have like a loyal following. So I think that's a tribute to how you've gone and built your business. Yeah, I mean, for sure. The other side of that is never, ever promote something just for money. The first time you do that and it's a shitty product, then you're doing it just because you can or every month or week or whatever, Mm -hmm. you're toast. You know, you're done in the long run. Nobody's going to buy from you after they do that two or three times. So last year we did one that I can remember affiliate promotion. Maybe we did a second. I don't remember. But we did one. Over the whole course of the entire year, I sent three emails to my audience and we made around $650,000 in commissions Mm. from three emails. And so, you know, why? Again, it's because it's a product that I believe in. And two, it's the first promotion I've done in over a year. So people are obviously going to perk up and pay attention if I'm willing to to talk about something like that. So that's, I think, a, a pretty important takeaway for folks. Yeah. I think another thing here, we talked about your email list a little bit. Like you've said this in the past. I love this example. You talk about, you know, Starbucks has thousands of stores and that's their distribution center where yours is, you know, capturing emails and building a relationship with people. And then when you have a business or you have something that you want to launch, you have this huge list of people to launch to and that's your distribution channel. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. And I don't care what people say. Email is still by far and away 10x the most effective when it comes to monetization when it comes to selling. Social media is fantastic for building rapport with folks, but it is horrific when it comes to selling. And so do both. If you want to put up an Instagram story every day, put up some photos, fantastic. But when it comes time to really sell your product or your service, nothing's more effective than email still. 
Yeah, and that's something you control. So even as people see the rise of like uh, bots and Facebook Messenger and that kind of thing, those things, you know, seem to be performing really well. But at the end of the day, you know, Facebook controls that kind of thing. And it could be like the Facebook page of like five years ago when you could get a ton of reach and now you get like zero reach on them. Yeah, yeah, without yeah. a doubt. So that's a great point. So you you had this big email list, you created this webinar, you said you'd never done one before. How was that? Did you just take like what you learned through copywriting and just follow the same script or did you study other people that did webinars? Well, it's the same framework, right? The difference is, is that now you've got an hour and a half instead of 30 minutes of someone's really undivided attention. And so it allows you to make a much more thorough case. It allows you to teach, spend more time teaching. And because you have more time, it gives you more time to build trust and rapport, which means it gives you a bigger opportunity to sell a more expensive product, right? So I think webinars are fantastic for selling something that's you know, 300 bucks or more. I think it's overkill for anything less than that. But I'd never really done it before. I just kind of crossed my fingers and recorded it and hoped for the best. And I think a big part of it is market timing. You know, we launched that again at the end of 2010. People are still feeling and recovering from the financial fallout. Mm -hmm. And we were the only company out there with an average Joe, myself, who's not talking about charts and earnings ratios or using all of this extensive financial language or imagery to just talk a matter of factly, like, you know, you and I would talk about money and what our desires are and our fears are. Sure. Uh, we're the only ones who are doing everything in video, everybody else in that world is still doing emails and articles and, and again, sophisticated charts and sophisticated language and talking about stocks all day. We weren't doing any of that. And that was intentional. So when we went out and started studying all of the competition, it was, what can we do that's the complete opposite of everything else out there? Because I was the complete opposite of everything else out there. Everything else out there was coming from the experts and the gurus and the analysts. I'm coming from a place of stupidity. <laughs> so what would I want to watch? What are they not doing? How can we stand out and do things differently and connect with middle America, which was who we were targeting, instead of folks who are you know, day traders? Yeah. And that's interesting. I think as Sally Hogshead talks about different is better than better. And I found that to be true with, with lead quizzes in our business as well. Just sometimes just being different and standing out is better than just trying to compete with every single person. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. I mean, I would definitely look at your competition and say, what can we do better and what can we do to stand out and be different? Yeah. Yeah. Cool. Okay. So you launched this, you guys did $3.2 million with it. What was kind of like the, the evolution of the Elevation Group? You know, well, all of a sudden, holy smokes, we've got something here that could be much bigger than just my little lifestyle business. And so we started building a team. We got an office. We did about $10 million in revenue in our first year. And the only interesting part, I think, about that story was in year two, the 18th lesson we produced was with this guy in Australia who ended up being a con artist. <laughs> and that was a very unfortunate turn of events. But you know, we invested money with him. A lot of our members invested money with this guy and he ended up being just a, a complete con man and it got lost. And we had to spend a lot of time, me specifically talking to the FBI and the SEC and the authorities to prosecute these guys. And fortunately they were found guilty, but it put me and my business partner and my team and, and the brand and everything through the ringer for sure. So that was definitely the biggest challenge I've ever gone through in business. Yeah, that was huge. And I remember, so when that happened, your your partner, Robert, also went through cancer. And I'm sure some of that came from yeah. the stress. Yeah, yeah. I went through divorce. He went through cancer. Or yeah. business essentially got whacked. And it was a brutal, you know, about three years, really, where it all went away. Did you feel like giving up at that point? Or what was it like emotionally going through that? It was very difficult because the error that was made was made by somebody else. And it wasn't within my power, you know, to mm -hmm. that individual. It's like, they did what they did. And now I have to handle the consequences from that. So that really sucked because, you know, it obviously affects your reputation and people's view of you and all of those things. So going through that was unbelievably difficult. Mm -hmm. And the biggest challenge that I had was we wanted to stay in business all the way through it because I thought that was important. And we wanted to keep the team hired all the way through the process as well. We didn't want to have to fire anyone. And we're like, we're just going to slug our way through this until it's over and done with. And, you know, the bad news is that that was the wrong decision to make as far as keeping the team on goes, because we were not profitable at that point. We were hemorrhaging money. And so I was essentially blowing through my personal savings to pay payroll. Mm. And this wasn't for a month or two. This was for a year and a half, right? This was the uh, whole ramp up time? You're investing ahead? 
uh, just all the money my business had made I'd accumulated, right? And so, so now it's going out the other way to, to pay salaries for, mm-hmm. you know, eight, nine, 10 people. And we shouldn't have done that. We should have fired everybody and just kept it on essentially life support, which was, re- we didn't need a big team to run this business. It was very simple. Mm-hmm. So looking back, that was my biggest mistake is we should have cut overhead down to the last dollar that we could instead of keeping it where it was when we were at our height. So that was a big mistake. That's a big lesson. And you don't even have to be Mike size, I think, to learn from that. I remember when we were first starting, like we had a similar thing. We lost some clients and we held on to some employees longer than was financially like responsible because like we weren't bringing in, you know, sales as quick as we could. And we lost a hundred thousand dollars. So not nearly as much as I'm sure Mike, you probably went through, but I think the lesson can be applied to any business. If, if you get in that, that kind of area, profits and cash are really good. What's going to keep you alive. Yeah, you know, uh, Robert always has a saying that I found to be very true in any category, which is if you have to ask the question, you already know the answer. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I mean, that's true with anything, with yeah. relationships, with this. So if you're having to ask the question, should we fire people and reduce overhead, you already know what the answer is, and you probably should have done it three months ago. And so, yeah. We'll get back to the show in a minute, but first, a quick thanks to our sponsor, Lead Quizzes. If you want to grow your business to seven figures and beyond, you must learn how to generate leads predictably. When I first started my business, lead generation felt like riding a roller coaster. I would have huge sales months and then months with nothing. This happened because I relied solely on referrals and networking to grow my business. Predicting growth and investing in the future were frightening because I didn't have control over my lead generation. That was before we created lead quizzes. Now I predictably generate leads in my sleep and have stopped worrying about where the next sale will come from. Top marketers like Neil Patel and Lewis House have used lead quizzes to increase their lead capture by up to 500%. Think about it. Quizzes are fun, engaging, and you can offer personalized feedback in exchange for your quiz takers' contact information. Lead quizzes is a software that allows you to set up high converting quizzes quickly without having to hire an expensive programmer. In fact, our users have generated over 3 million leads for their businesses. Take control of your lead generation today and start your 14-day free trial by going to leadquizzes.com slash podcast. All right, so you hit that area. This guy was a con artist. You're losing a lot of money. Like, How did you get through that? What did you guys end up doing? Well, once they were found guilty and there was some finality to it, I gave my half of the business to Robert because I've been through enough. My affinity for that world was over. I needed to go start something new and different. So that's it. I went to Tony Robbins Day with Destiny in 2014. That was the one they made the documentary at. Mm -hmm. And that's really what I needed to pull me out of my funk and restart. And so that's where the ideas for Evergrow and and Self-Made Man were born, essentially. Yeah. So real quick, Mike, I think it'd be interesting. So you said like Day with Destiny helped you get through that. Like that's a major thing. And a lot of entrepreneurs go through these downtimes. Like, yeah. What did you get from that conference that was able to help pull you through? You know, I don't know exactly other than the fact that I finally allowed myself to move forward and I stopped feeling sorry for myself and what I had went through and I stopped focusing on the bad stuff that had taken place. And I was like, okay, it's been two, three years now. I need to move forward. It's been long enough. And so that event is really what inspired me or gave me whatever I needed to do that. So okay, it's a big deal. Okay. Awesome. All right. And then you said you started setting up these new programs. Yeah. So the ideas were moving forward. My goals were to build a business that was not dependent upon me anymore. I wanted to build a company that I could sell. And you can't sell a business if you're the face and the name of the company, which I had been previously. So there were two problems that I was really passionate about at the time. One was organic food. You know, I had a young child and I live across from Whole Foods in Austin here. And so eating healthy, organic food is is a priority. And I was very annoyed by the fact that you essentially have to be quite wealthy in order to afford to eat food that's not covered in poison. And I thought that was pretty messed up. So I started reading a lot of stuff from Peter Diamandis and decentralization and the trends that had been happening over the previous 10 to 15 years that we've seen here in the form of Uber, 99designs, Airbnb, Odesk, and all of these companies that have essentially decentralized their industries. And I realized that nobody had really done that in farming yet or agriculture. And I didn't really see a good reason as to why not, other than that's the way things have always been done, right? So if 
you're going to reduce food costs, the way to do that is the same way those other companies have, which is to get rid of all of the waste in the middle, all of the middlemen, all of the distribution and all of that other stuff. And it starts and ends with the end consumer. So the concept was, let's put an organic farm in everybody's house. So all of it takes place there and we get rid of all of that waste in the middle. And in order to do that successfully, it's got to be easy. Anybody's got to be able to do it. It has to be automated. There has to be technology involved and it has to look great and it be something someone wants to do in their home. And it also has to produce enough food to replace your run to the grocery store. It's not like you can grow some basil and some mint and solve a problem here. It like literally needs to produce hundreds of dollars of food a month. Sure. So that was an interesting project for me because it's something I was passionate about, but I've never grown anything. I had no idea how to farm or grow vegetables. I had never developed a tech product. I'd never developed a physical product. And so all I had was an idea. And I knew that if we can make the right product, it would sell. I knew there was a market for it. So I literally started cold calling industrial design firms in Austin and Texas and around the country. And I went to 99designs and I had a Photoshop guy just make a little render of the concept visually the best that I could, you know, and I, I took a Photoshop of a kitchen setting and I told them kind of what to put and put some plants on it and, and made this kind of cool looking demo photo so that I could show it to these firms and give them an idea of what the hell I was talking about. Mm -hmm. I eventually ended up going with one of the top two companies in the country in Silicon Valley. And we just literally would fly out there on a plane and get in front of a whiteboard and start drawing out the designs and the concepts. And how are we going to make this produce the most amount of food in a giving volume of space. We're limited in size by the fact that it needs to fit in through a standard door frame in anybody's house, right? That's going to be the size limitation. Sure. I bought all of the existing systems that were already available on the market that were manual. They weren't automated, but they were the best in the class at the time and started figuring out what in the hell was wrong with these and why did they suck? What did I hate about them? A lot of them were the lights. The lights are oriented vertically in a circle around maybe a center pole, if you will, which means that no matter where it is in the house, light is shining out onto you and the rest of the room in some form or fashion, which is horrible. Mm -hmm. So how can we orient the lights facing downward like a normal lamp so that it's not shining in your eyes all the time, right? If people are going to put this in the corner, which they likely would, how are you going to get access to the back of the unit and the back and the plants back there? So we just started figuring this out. I got on Amazon and I ordered the top five books on hydroponics and aquaponics and things like that. Started reading up on the subject and just started moving forward. The, the biggest piece was, is how are you going to fund this though? This is not going to be cheap. You know, minimum I knew it was going to cost at least half a million bucks to develop the prototype. Yeah, this is not like any of your other businesses are launching information courses. We're building a product, a high-tech appliance that has never been built before, literally. Mm -hmm. you know, so we're having to figure out a lot for the first time. And so that's when I started building Mike Dillard Mentoring and, and List Grow. It's like I need two products that I can sell automatically that will produce three hundred dollars to $400,000 a month in revenue with, you know, let's say at least a 50% profit margin. And they need to be able to be sold via an automated webinar and I'd never have to touch them until Evergrow is off the ground. And so I started with building those two products, did exactly that. Luckily, they converted, you know, with paid Facebook traffic. And we just started selling ten dollars to $20,000 of those a day, like clockwork, for two years. Okay. And that's the money that funded the development of Evergrow, which ballooned far beyond five hundred grand. It ended up getting up to the million-dollar-plus range before we even got to completion. Yeah. So Mike, so we're kind of in the current day, you're still selling list grow. You have Mike Diller mentoring. Why did you decide you needed two different products? You know, we started with list grow because I think if you're going to have one product and that's all the time I had to develop at the moment, you need a high dollar product. You need something that's at least one to $2,000 in price Okay. because it's at anything less, you're not going to have enough money left over for a profit. If you're selling something that's $300, you're going to spend hundred to two hundred dollars of that on ad spend, then you're gonna have overhead and refunds. And if you need to make 100, 150 grand a month in profit, you're just not gonna sell that much of them. I'd much rather sell a fifteen hundred dollar, two thousand dollar product and get five, 10, 15 customers a day and that be it. And if you have that high of a price point, you're gonna be good. You're gonna be able to acquire customers for three hundred to five hundred bucks a piece. You're gonna put five hundred away for overhead and refunds, you're gonna put five hundred in your pocket. And you just can't do that with lower price products. But eventually, 
95 to 98 percent of all of those prospects or leads you generate are not going to buy that product mm -hmm. two or three percent will so what do you do with all of those folks who said no which is the vast majority well that's when you need something for 97 bucks that's a front end that you can offer to them and at least give them an opportunity to get to know you and your brand and your work and then maybe they'll come back and buy one of those larger products, right? At bare minimum, it's going to help you offset your ad costs. Cool. And then 97 was $97 a month? No, it was just, I think I started at 37 a month. And then, you know, now I sell it for a one-time fee of 97 because I just don't need the cash flow anymore. We've, things have changed. So if you want to hear the whole full story, go to evergrow.com. But eventually I got to a point where after two and a half years of developing the product and a million bucks you know, spent on it, I was like, hey guys, how much is this really gonna cost to get us to a production ready state? Where we've done the software, we've done the website, we've done the marketing, we've done the mobile app development, we've done the safety testing and the production run and the tooling and all of this other stuff. Mm -hmm. And they're like, well, it's gonna take another two, two and a half million bucks. I was like, awesome. So, and at that same time, a competitor who'd already been in the market, they're already funded by Y Combinator. They've got $30 million in VC money. They've got a team of 25 people. And, you know, they came out with three other products at that same moment in time that essentially competed with what we had built. It was growing 35 plants, 51 plants, and ours grew 36. But they, frankly, had a more efficient design and they could sell their product for a thousand bucks where ours was going to retail for 3,000. And so I'm faced with the fact that at this point, I'm going to have to go raise money to finish development. And I'm going to be coming onto the market a year later with an inferior product that's twice the price, three times the price. And that's not a good position to be in. So what I ended up doing was calling the founder of that company and reaching out to him and having a couple of phone conversations and finding out what they had down the pipeline that you know the public is not aware of. And then I'm like, oh, all right, they're so far beyond where we could possibly be. It's not even funny. It's just that people don't know where they're going yet. So I ended up investing in them in a seed round and, uh, or bridge round, I should say, and I pulled the plug on Evergrow. So that was a year ago. And my expectation is, you know, in the next three to five years, I have a shot at getting my, my million bucks back when they sell, you know, and have an exit. So I think that was a huge learning lesson for me as far as going into a completely new industry. You know, you pay the stupid tax one way or another. <laughs> pay it in the form of making mistakes and your lack of knowledge, or you pay it in the form of consulting and hiring and expertise to get people with the knowledge. But the price just got too high for me. And I was like, okay, I, I found an elegant way out of this. Let me go back to the world that I know, but let me apply my skill set there in a way that is at a different level that still allows me to meet my goal of building an asset and a company and a brand that I can have an exit from. So that's when I turned my attention to, to Self-Made Man and what we've been building there for the last year now. And yeah, so that's kind of brings us up to today. Awesome. All right. So yeah, you mentioned Self-Made Man. I think it's probably a good transition time to talk about that. So you've been running this podcast, Self-Made Man, for maybe it's been like a year or two now. About two years now. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And so similar, going out and interviewing people, I know you've been using that as a strategy to continue to provide value and content to a lot of those people that didn't become customers. And so now what's coming next? Tell us what's next with Self Made Man. Yeah, you know, I started the podcast because I needed a way to provide value to my list and stay in touch with them while I was building Evergrow. And a podcast I thought was the most efficient way to do that because it wasn't me having to produce the content every week. It was a guest. <laughs> so, But it kind of took on a life of its own and grew like crazy and it's been one of the biggest ROIs I've ever seen, you know, from an activity and putting value out to an audience and the ROI we've gotten in the form of goodwill. You know, we don't monetize it. I've never made a penny from it. But the amount of goodwill that it's created for myself and for the brand has been second to none. It's just been awesome. Can you describe that, Mike? So I know you're not doing like sponsorships or anything like that. You've got to have a podcast that's doing a million downloads a month or more to make ten to fifteen thousand dollars a month in sponsorship, which mm -hmm. we do well. We do like 150,000 downloads a month. But to have sponsorships to make two grand a month, it's not worth my time to mess yep. with. I'd rather just give the audience a great experience that's ad free. So that's the decision around that. And so yeah, just putting out value every week for two years now with amazing guests in a, you know, a format that's more interesting than the written word, frankly, has just been great. You know, we get emails every day from folks who are like, I listen to your show every single day and that have been really helped and served by it. So that's it. Just the amount of goodwill that's come from give, 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 give every week for two years has been fantastic. So, 
Awesome. And so like, that's, I guess, a really important lesson is continue to give value and content to your customers or to your leads that follow you. I think one of the things that you've done really interesting, like I don't want to spend too much time on it, but we'd love to just ask like, Mike, you brought amazing guests onto your podcast and you could probably riff off a few of them, but how did you get to those people? Was it continuing to level up your guests and leveraging those to get people or what was your strategy there? Thankfully, after being in this world for 10 years, I have a good Rolodex of personal contacts. So that's who I started with. And we, you know, again, having an advantage of having an email list when we launched the show, we didn't have to worry about where our first downloads were going to come from. We just promoted it to our audience. And within, I think, 24 hours, we were number one in our category, right? So now we've got social proof. We've got 10,000 downloads in a day. And and all of those things you can then take to potential guests and show them and say, hey, look, we've got one of the fastest growing shows out there. Come and use it as a platform to share your brand and your message. But it's a catch-22, right? What if you don't have an audience? Good luck. It's going to be a lot of hard work and you're going to have to think of something very unique to get noticed and build momentum. You're going to have to build a show that's very unique. And there's a really big distinction people should make when it comes to a podcast and that is the fact that there are podcasts and their primary platform for an individual or brand, let's say like Tim Ferriss or Lewis Howes or Art of Charm, mm-hmm. where that's their main gig, right? That's their version of my email list. And that's their main distribution channel and audience. So that's their business. For me, the podcast is only designed to give value to my existing audience, primarily in my email list, right? So I'm not doing a podcast to build an audience. I'm doing a podcast to serve an existing audience, which is infinitely easier than trying to build one from scratch. So if you're going to try and build a podcast from scratch, I would go do something different. Uh, If you you have an audience already, maybe via email or social or whatever, and you want to serve them in an additional format, then starting a podcast is a great idea. Kind of what you're doing exactly right here, right? So That's a really important distinction. And then, yeah, you do whatever you can to get an A-list guest. Because once you get one or two A-list people on your show, make a donation to their charity, pay them money, do whatever you need to do so that you can then go forward and on the next people you invite, be like previous guests include Tony Robbins and Damon John and all of these other A-listers, right? Then people are just like, oh, yeah, of course I'll do your show. They don't even really look. And that's a great point. Like that's, that reminds me of what Jason Gaynor did when he was starting his conference, which was he went out and bought books from Tim Ferriss and got him to be a keynote speaker at this event and provide a lot of social credibility to his events and what he does there. Yeah, I call it the spiral of ascension, you know, if you will, of credibility and guest, you know, celebrity. And so, you know, we've had Gene Simmons and Mike Rowe on and, Mm -hmm. and so now we can put those names out there and It just makes it that much easier. So the hardest part is just getting that first person with some street cred on. Yeah. From personal experience, like we went out and got Neil Patel as a case study for our, for lead quizzes. And like some of that is just the hustle. Like for us, we reached out to Neil Patel. We said, Hey, we'll do this amazing case study with you, or we'll set up a quiz for you for free. If it works on your site, we'll do a case study with you. And so sometimes it just comes down to just putting in like the time and paying it forward. And then, you know, you can reap the results from that. Yeah, absolutely. Cool. All right. So we're going to get to kind of wrapping up here. I think, Mike, I'll ask you just a few more questions. Like, what's the one thing you did that had the biggest impact on your growth or your career? Again, just becoming a voracious student when it comes to marketing and acquiring skills. The biggest challenge I see today, especially with young entrepreneurs in their 20s, is they really don't have the attention span to go deep enough into a subject matter to master Mm -hmm. it and get it really good at it, which is what is required to achieve success in anything. Yeah. You know, it's like, well, I watched this hour long blog or webinar training session on Facebook advertising or building an Instagram channel. And now I'm supposed to be able to do it right. And like, no, you know, it's going to require you 20, 30, 40 hours of study practice and training to get deep enough into any of these skill sets to where you can actually use it effectively. And so I feel concerned for the Instagram, Snapchat generation, if you will, who consumes content at 60 second intervals, because I have bookshelves filled with three ring binder after binder, after binder, after binder of courses that I've bought and read through tens of thousands of pages to learn copywriting and learn Google AdWords and learn how to code a website and all of these other things. And so that to me is it. If you're not nose down for two, three hours a night going through a three ring binder on a subject, you're not doing it right. 
And you're just going to find yourself in the same position five years from now. Yeah, that's great advice. I first heard that advice in a book and it said like, whenever I try to learn a new subject, I go out and get 10 books on that subject and just read through them. And for me, like I use that strategy when I was learning sales and that's what helped me learn how to sell and be able to hit our first like seven figures in our business. So I think that's an amazing point that you just have to go really deep. Yeah, you have to be completely obsessed. And your goal is to master one skill set. Yeah. You can master one skill set, you're set. You can build a seven figure, you know, business around that one single skill, mm -hmm. if nothing else. But you have to become one of the best in the world at it. Okay, awesome. All right. Well, just to wrap up, Mike, where can people go to like learn about you? Yeah, just go to MikeDiller.com. We've got everything up there, self-made and ever grow and all that good stuff. So awesome. And then do you want to share anything about what you're launching in the next couple of months or should they just go there and, you know, opt into the podcast and you'll let them know? Yeah, just go to MikeTiller.com and get on the email list and or listen to the podcast. And we'll be going through the big launch here in about a month, six weeks. It'll be awesome. It'll be really, really cool. And obviously, you know that because you're part of it. <laughs> so yeah, it's going to be neat. Yep. Yep. So Mike flew us out to go film a course from there and he's filming a lot of courses with some very, very sharp, bright people. So definitely go follow him. Keep your eyes open for this launch. Mike, thank you so much for joining us and sharing your story today. You bet, brother. Great to talk to you again. And thanks for having me. Awesome. Thanks again for listening to our show this week. If you want to find out more about Mike Dillard and the lessons he shared today or read our show notes, visit leadquizzes.com slash one. If you'd like to start generating more leads for your business and get a 14-day free trial to Lead Quizzes, go to leadquizzes.com slash podcast. Please also subscribe to our show on Apple or however you get your podcasts. I'm Jeremy Allens, and you've been listening to Journey to Seven Figures.